Hello, uh, um, I am Costantina Zanu. I am um, an assistant professor of Italian, um, specializing in Mediterranean studies in the Italian department of Columbia University. And welcome to the second event of our uh, Italian Mediterranean colloquium of this semester. Um, um, the colloquium is uh, very generously co-sponsored by the Italian department and the European Institute. Um, and uh, today we're here to celebrate the publication uh, of th three recent books, uh, which I think that they can um, be in a very fruitful and interesting dialogue, dialogue with each other. Um, and I am happy to welcome with us the three amazing ladies who are their authors. So let me uh, present them first, and then I will say two things about the process of the, uh, of the event. Let me, let's start with Julia. Julia Bonazza is currently Marie Curie a Global Fellow at Columbia University and Ca Foscari Venice with a project titled The Tar Darker Shades of Black, the value of skin color in the Mediterranean and Atlantic slave and labor markets from 1750 to 1886. She's a former fellow of the German Historical Institute in Rome and former Max Weber a postdoctoral fellow at the Europe European University Institute in Florence. Um, she is the author of the book that she's presenting today, Abolitionism and the Persistence of Slavery in Italian States from 1750 to 1850, and of a number of articles in the history of slavery and the Mediterranean, uh, in the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. Pamela Balliger uh, holds the Fred Cuny Chair in the History of Human Rights in the Department of History at the University of Michigan, and is currently a visiting fellow at the Freiburg Institute for Advanced Studies. She's actually uh, joining us from Germany now. She's the author of History in Exile, Memory and Identity at the Borders of the Balkans, published in 2003, uh, and translated into Italian as La Memoria dell'Esilio, and of the book she's presenting today, The World the Refugees Made, Decolonization and the Foundation of Post-War Italy, published in 2020. Her areas of expertise include human rights, forced migration, refugees, fascism, sea space, and modern Mediterranean and Balkan history. Finally, Silvana Patriarca is professor of history at Fordham Univers University. She specializes in the social and cultural history of modern Italy, and in particular in the history of nationalism and the construction of national identity. She is the author of Numbers and Nationhood, Writing St Statistics in 19th Century Italy, and of Italian Vices, Nation and Character from the Risorgimento to the Republic. They were both published by Cambridge University Press and translated into Italian. She has co-edited with Lucy Ryle, The Risorgimento Revisited, Nationalism and Culture in 19th Century Italy, and is the co-editor with Valeria De Plano of a special issue of the journal Modern Italy devoted to nation, race, and racism in 20th century Italy. Her new book, Il Colore della Repubblica, Fili della Guerra e Razzismo nell'Italia Postfascista, has just been published by Einaudi. The English edition titled Race and po in po Postfascist Italy, War Children and the Color of the Nation will appear with Cambridge University Press in February of next year. So welcome all and thank you for being here. Uh, let me say two words about how this will be. Uh, there will be a presentation by the authors themselves, uh, 15 minutes, um, minutes max maximum each. Then I will just have some, I will open the floor with one, a couple of questions, one or two questions. And then I think uh, we have all read the, wor the works of everybody and we have prepared uh, questions and observations and things that we have in our mind, but we want to include the public in this discussion. So then after they respond to my initial uh, question, we will open to the public and please, you can write work, your question in the chat or write Q and then I will give you uh, the word to, um, to uh, speak, uh, tell us your question and then we can mix our own uh, op questions and observations and comments with your own. Right, so let's begin. Uh, it will not take more than one hour and a half. I'm just saying this, <laughs> not, not to frighten you. Okay, I think we'll start chronologically. So Julia, you're first, you can begin. Yes, so thank you, uh, 
Costantina, uh, for inviting uh, me. I am uh, really honored to be in a such important uh, panel. Um, do you see my PowerPoint? Um, so um, my book is uh, the result of my PhD dissertation. Uh, uh, it's not uh, really new because it was published in 2019, uh, mm. uh, but it's true that after uh, the pandemic situation, I had not many chance uh, uh, to present uh, it. I'm very happy to share my work also here in Colombia and uh, in United States. Um, so uh, my book, uh, um, has two main focus. One is uh, on uh, abolitionism in Italian state, legal and intellectual abolitionism. I want to show that um, the debate in the Italian state was uh, merely focused on against colonial slavery and uh, it didn't focus uh, on the form of slavery in Italian state uh, um, that persisted until the half of the 19th century. Uh, the second part of my book uh, is really um, the archival research. So I found the slave cases in cities as Palermo, Naples, Caserta, Rome, Livorno and Genoa. Um, in this uh, late chronological period, so 1750 and 1850, that uh, um, was uh, less studied by the existing historiography um, existing on captivity and slavery in the Italian city. Uh, a third part of the book uh, is more experimental because it's on the memory and heritage of slavery in the Italian space. Uh, and uh, but I think today it's really in dialogue uh, um, with the work of uh, uh, Pamela and uh, uh, with the yeah. So uh, this is the structure of my book and um, the historiography. Uh, my starting point where, where book really different. So um, some work really on captivity in Mediterranean as the the book of Wolfgang Kaiser, Le Commerce des Captifs, but also this new historiography as Mediterranean slavery revisited, um, who try to recognize that Mediterranean slavery is not, is not only a slavery of reciprocity, it's not only captivity uh, between uh, um, the Southern European country and the Ottoman Empire and its satellite states. And uh, uh, for the part on abolitionism, um, one of my starting point was the book of Alexandro Tuccillo, Il Commercio um, Infame on Anti-Slavery Thought, mainly in Naples in the 18th century. Um, probably all we know the important legal abolition of slavery before the abolition of slave trade in 1807, many abolition in important countries as uh, France, Great Britain, Spain, who had a formal colonial empire in early modern period. It's less known the Italian and German case because they are very complex because uh, we had a um, different state and not a formal colonial empire during the early modern period, but only um, we can say an, an implication of the on the slave uh, trade and today we know there are important book uh, in this direction uh, to discover this new history. Um, in general, in the Italian case, the abolition of slavery from a legal point of view were mainly influenced uh, by outside of so France and Great Britain. And uh, we had many abolitionist law. Um, and also Napoleon freed slaves when he arrived in Genova and Livorno in um, 1797. Um, the problem of this papal state is a little bit different uh, because uh, papal state had never a formal law, um, internal law against uh, slavery inside. But as we well know, uh, Papa State was a big sponsor during all the 19th century of the transnational abolitionism in support of the Great Britain, uh, starting from the Congress of Vienna and the figure of Cardinal Consalvi. The intellectual part uh, um, of my book, more on uh, 
the reflection on abolitionist thinker was based on newspaper annals works and uh, um, also I consulted some uh, university course uh, uh, syllabus to see how um, the thinker and the intellectual of the time thought about the problem of uh, slavery. So these are some sources that uh, I have used and uh, um, one uh, of the result, uh, because I think there is a lot of uh, to do in this direction, uh, is that the debate about slavery and colonial slavery um, was really present, but uh, um, it was really a reflection only um, a condemnation of the Atlantic trade uh, there were some reflections and extra dedicated to uh, Mediterranean slavery and the problem of Christian slaves in the Ottoman Empire and the satellite state, uh, but there are not reflections on the problem of, uh, um, of slavery inside uh, um, the Italian city, also in the first half of the 19th century. So there is a persistence of, uh, of this phenomenon, but it seemed not taken in consideration by the thinker of that time. Uh, concerning the part really on slave cases, um, so scholar who studied Mediterranean slavery um, often use the definition proposed by Michel Fontanet on the difference between a captive and a slave. Um, so in Mediterranean, um, so slave is a permanent condition, slavery is a permanent condition of uh, our freedom from a legal point of view, and the slave is important for his working value, uh, but not really for his exchange value as a captive in Mediterranean basin. Um, a captivity is usually a temporary condition of slavery. In reality, in my book, as uh, Salvatore Bono, I prefer to use uh, uh, only the word slaves. Uh, first, because in the taxonomy of sources, uh, I don't find the word captive, but also because when uh, captive and slaves arrived in Italian port, they lived the same living and working condition often, and not all the captives who arrived in the Italian cities were ransomed, uh, so um, I prefer to use the word slave. Um, so um, I think the interesting um, new aspect of this history is that in Italian city we, we find uh, also Atlantic slaves and not only slave fr slaves from the um, Ottoman Empire, um, due to the intersection of trade. Um, to find these cases, I uh, use Baptist Register, Catechumen Archival Group, Soldiers and Gallies Archival Group, Sources of the Redemption Society, and Legal Sources, because slaves um, also appear in many disputes. Um, slaves were used as uh, uh, rowers in galleys, soldiers, mainly domestic workers, as in other countries of Europe, and also they were employed in manufacture. Uh, this is one of the register of uh, slaves that I found for um, Naples. Um, so this is uh, a case of a baptized slaves um, from uh, Naples. And we see that Pasquale in 1925 um, was baptized and he was born uh, on a Portuguese uh, vessel. His mother was an African slave. And uh, you see um, after the conversion, uh, Pasquale um, adopted a new Christian name, uh, Maria Salvadore Raffaele Francesco Marino Caffiero, the family name is the same of the master, um, or uh, it could be uh, often as in Rome, uh, the family name, it could be the family name of a cardinal, um, as we see many sources in the House of Catechumens of Rome. Um, so uh, the last slave uh, found in Naples is dated 1845. Um, the problem of Version is really important and well studied um, in Italy. Uh, we know uh, 
many work uh, uh, about Marina Caffiero, Serena Di Nippi, Giovanna Fiume, um, but uh, we can say that uh, for this chronological period um, that I have analyzed, there were, uh, there were not uh, studies and uh, um, the problem of conversion was still crucial. Um, and a first step uh, for slaves to try to achieve the legal freedom and improve his status. Because after the baptism, for sure, uh, the slaves start to earn um, often money but to have a better uh, working and living condition. Uh, but uh, um, I have not the proof that they are immediately legally free uh, because this is proved by many converted slave petitions who slave who received the baptism 10 years before and they ask it to be freed because they are not still um, they are not still free. Um, so um, the conversion in, uh, in Rome um, of uh, the slaves that I found um, was in the house of catechumens. And this is interesting also uh, from um, a labor perspective because in this year of the education, slaves cannot work. And uh, for their uh, livelihood, the casa gave them three bowls of bread. We have uh, some description on how they lived. And uh, um, this is interesting because the papal state, uh, for instance, in some period, uh, posed limitation to the conversion of slaves who worked on galleys. So uh, as Lucette Valencia uh, mentioned um, many years ago, the problem of conversion is also a problem of them and the supply. Uh, because uh, for sure uh, in this period, at the beginning of the 19th century, in which uh, uh, the use of galley was still enforced, but in decline, uh, because uh, at the half of the 19th century we have not galleys, uh, the workforce of the rowers of the rowers of these slaves was still important. Uh, in connection with the problem of color and race, that is um, also one of the of the subject of today in connection also with the book of Silvana, we can say that uh, um, the problem of uh, skin color and description um, are mainly in Catholic sources, the, the, in which sometimes we found the adjective as turca nigra on, as we know, uh, Nigeria is described as uh, regione nigrorum and uh, um, in uh, state archival sources, the problem of uh, the description of the color um, is more difficult uh, to be found. Even if uh, the quality uh, are described as the strength of, the, of a slave, if the slave is sick, um, but I think it is, it is interesting to notice that this description of color uh, is mainly in, uh, um, in Catholic sources and less in, in state archival sources. These are some um, quantitative uh, um, results of, um, of my research. As you see, there are not many cases of slavery in this late period, but it is interesting to, to see that they, they are in Italian city until um, a late chronological period. So um, in Livorno and Palermo, I found the Moorish slave and, and black slaves uh, at a lower exchange value than the other Levantine slaves. Uh, and often they are not exchangeable, exchangeable commodities, but uh, is not really due to the, to the color in itself. Uh, um, I think I have discussed it, it with many colleagues, but is uh, um, more the fact uh, that uh, these slaves, uh, um, the state, uh, the Barbary state, and uh, had not an interest in, uh, in ransom um, them often. Um, so um, I think in this case, it's not uh, uh, probably the color that mattered, but uh, um, more uh, the color as a symbol of a geographical origin. 
of the slaves. Um, and uh, um, I think that often what we see um, in group uh, uh, in, in sources uh, uh, is that, for instance, if we see the composition of the number of captives and slaves on a vessel, how in this case we see that this, when they arrived in Naples, became all slaves, but the people, in, as in this case, who had a job as soldier, uh, sailor, but there are some Moorish slaves as the last uh, four who are already slaved, uh, slaves in the vessel. So it doesn't mean that in this case, uh, they cannot be uh, ransomed, but these men are um, only uh, important for their uh, working value when they arrive, uh, as in this case, uh, in Palermo. So in general, I, I found that for two Turkish slaves, we have one Christian, for five, for five black slaves, two Christian, more or less in this period at the beginning of the 19th century. Um, my uh, last chapter of the book before to the conclusion uh, is uh, on, the, on the memory and um, heritage of slavery in Italian state. Uh, for me, it was really more an experimental chapter to try to insert the Italian debate in the European debate. And uh, um, what we can understand uh, is that in Italy, um, not only the name of the street or many status as the famous statue of the former Livorno, but there are many paintings uh, that prove that many Italian noble families had slaves. Um, and also that we had many people of color in Italy in 19th century during also the Risorgimento uh, War. And uh, um, I, this history um, is started to be discovered now, uh, but I think uh, um, there is uh, um, a lot uh, to do in this direction. And this, in this chapter, I connect the forgotten memory of the slavery um, in Europe at the end of the early modern uh, period, also in connection of the problem with the forgotten, neglected history of uh, uh, the Italian colonialism um, in the liberal uh, Italian period, so not the colonialism associated to fascism, but this uh, uh, period, the important period, the end of the 19th century. And uh, so um, I stop me now uh, because uh, I think it will be interesting to discuss uh, this problem also after with the colleague. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Julia, for this. Uh, okay, if you can stop sharing now, so we pass the yeah. floor to Pamela. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, Pamela, uh, the floor is yours. I'm just waiting a moment. There's a little bit of a delay for the screen sharing. I see. Um, okay. Yes. But thank you, Constantina, for conceiving of this and organizing it. And it's really an honor to um, have this discussion with Silvana and Julia. Um, it was great to read your really amazing books. So in my book, The World Refugees Made, I examined displaced persons in early post-war Italy, focusing on individuals who came to the Italian peninsula from the territories that Italy lost as a result of fascism's defeat and decolonization. Let's see. No, it's still not letting me in. Do you want me to open it? Please? If you could, that would be wonderful. Okay. Thank sure. you. I'm sorry. I don't know why it's... No problem. There we go. Now I see it. I don't know if I have control over it, though. Uh, let's... Oh, yeah. There we go. Um, so the study uses the marginal figure of the refugee among those categories of undesirable um, in which Savannah situates her biracial war children to unsettle a diverse set of scholarly literatures and debates. The book's narrative is largely chronological as it tracks through the migrations from and in some cases back to Italy's former possessions, the question of how to classify such migrants and the forms of assistance to which they were entitled and from whom, the role that debates over the identities of these migrants played in the redefinition of a post-imperial form of Italian citizenship, and then once the work of distinguishing citizens from aliens had been completed, the question of how to integrate 
those who legally belonged in Italy, but who often appeared to metropolitan Italians to be different. So this was the neighbor that was often referred to offhandedly as l'Africano or lo Slavo. And this is also a di dilemma that's highlighted by Silvana, that is the way that legal belonging is a necessary but not sufficient condition to be considered a genuine Italian, either in the past or the present. So Italia Oltremare, uh, just to remind us, consisted in colonies, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Somalia, which were joined together after 1936 as Africa Orientale Italiana, departments, so Libya and the Dodecanese Islands and protectorates, um, Albania. Italy lost de facto control. So Italy lost de facto control over all of these territories between 1941 and 1943 and formal de jure sovereignty between 1947 and 1960. If you can hit the next slide, slide please. In addition, between 1947 and 1954, Italy lost much of the Eastern Adriatic territory, so notably the Eastern Peninsula, Kvarner Islands, and the Dalmatian city of Zada, or Zadar today, that it had acquired in the wake of World War I. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Many of the individuals migrating out of these various territories would eventually be deemed national refugees, in contrast to those designated as international or bona fide refugees, according to the criteria of the then emergent international refugee regime that was centered on the United Nations. Next slide. Into the late 1950s and early 1960s, Italy also hosted many foreign displaced persons, Jews transiting through Italy, Russians, white Russians, Bulgarians, and Poles, and above all, Yugoslavs. Next slide. And here we see the image of um, a young uh, foreign refugee in the transit camp in San Saba in Trieste. So one cluster of arguments in the book centers on the politics and consequences of such classifications. Are these repatriates or refugees, national refugees or international refugees, which are also questions, of course, about citizens versus non-citizens. The attention that I pay in the book to complex taxonomies finds parallels in Julia's care in distinguishing between different forms of enslavement. Likewise, Julia demonstrates, as I do, the frequent gaps between formal categories, including those that scholars use, and uh, lived experience. So in demonstrating how the category of refugee became ultimately categorical, I evidence how what today may appear a naturalized legal distinction between refugees and so-called internally displaced persons, with the former eligible for assistance from intergovernmental agencies like UNHCR, and the latter the responsibility of their home states, right, so one of the benefits of formal citizenship, how this was achieved only through messy debates over how to classify the millions of persons displaced by the Second World War and its aftermaths. Debates over how to categorize displacees from Italy's lost territories engaged a wide range of factors. And this included personnel from the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, its successor, the International Refugee Organization, the Italian government, the Vatican, and the British military administrations that temporarily governed former territories in Africa and the Dodecanese Islands, although they um, were not in Ethiopia. The Italian case, except for a reserved area, but anyways, the Italian case um, evidences the intensive work required at the foundational moment of the international refugee system to exclude from the category of international refugee individuals like those migrating out of the former Italian possessions. And for the story of Italian citizenship, uh, this also underscores how at least until 1947, Italy was semi-sovereign at best and how controlling who entered and who remained in Italy, and then in turn who was recognized as a citizen, became a critical means by which the nascent republic consolidated its sovereignty. The histories of these various displa displacements to the Italian peninsula have only recently gained the sustained attention of scholars, but they're usually told as the stories of specific groups rather than a broader history of national refugees or as a history that's in conversation with broader histories of displacement. So given this lack, one of my aims in the book was conceptual, that is to put together migrants who are typically kept apart, international and national refugees, whose constitution was essentially a dialogic process, uh, but also the different populations that made up the Italian national refugees. And I see Julia undertaking a similar move as she puts the worlds and spaces of Mediterranean and Atlantic slavery in conversation, revealing their entanglements, but also their specificities. 
So immediately after the war, especially in the run-up to the 1947 peace treaty that renounced Italian claims on its colonies, the Italian state was not eager to return impoverished former settlers to the peninsula. And this in part was due to worries about housing shortages and unemployment. But it was also uh, a reflection of the hope that by keeping Italians in the overseas territories in place, that this would help strengthen claims to some form of continued rule there, whether it be direct control or a trusteeship, there were various kinds of proposals floated. The British military administrations in the former possessions, however, were eager to see Italians leave those territories for precisely the same reason, because these populations could create a potential claim in the negotiations over the future of the Italian territories. The situation was further complicated by the fact that some Italians who had left the colonies during the war wanted to return to them after the war. And this led to a situation of what maybe today we would call illegal migration, which was most acute in Libya, as young Italians departed Sicily and were landed at uh, isolated spots on the Libyan coastline, hoping to avoid detection by the British who often deported uh, such arrivals when they encountered them. This reality of multi-directional migration complicates facile labels of repatriation or so-called reverse migrations often applied to histories of settler return after decolonization and reminds us that the tight mapping of citizenship to a bounded territory is a recent development. Not only were many of these Italian nationals born in the colonies or felt those territories to be their genuine home, but a certain number of these overseas Italians had been born in the colonies of other European powers or the Ottomans. Possessed of Italian citizenship or in some instances a demi-citizenship owing to the Ottoman capitulatory regime, these, citizen, these individuals possessed an ambiguous Italian identity at best, and this was reflected often in their semi-citizenships. This ultimately, this ambiguity was captured um, in attempts by intergovernmental actors uh, in the UN who, when confronted with these complexities and uh, these legacies of Ita Italian colonial citizenship, which possessed a very complicated hierarchy of statuses, uh, they began to employ labels like undetermined dodecanese or undetermined Venezia Julian when referring to individuals whose identities, legal and social cultural, resisted nation state logics, right? Where the notion that somehow an ethnicity was going to map on to a national citizenship, um, that this turned out not to be the case or not clear to these individuals in the UN. Uh, next slide, please. Oops. We go. Um, yet another set of arguments in the book focuses on Italian decolonization. The book challenges the commonplace that Italy has or continues to suffer from amnesia about colonialism um, and its end, or that decolonization was a non event at the time. You can turn your sound off if you want. Arguing. Can, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'm still I'm hearing some other people. That's why I was confused. <laughs> Arguing instead that Italy experienced a long decolonization. I show how the extended negotiations over Italy's various territories mobilized public opinion at key moments, even as the presence of migrants from those areas altered both juridical and built environments. And once we begin to pay attention to these remainders of empire, in this case, these national refugees, one realizes that the issue is really one of politics of visibility more than any kind of wholesale amnesia. But I wanna stress here that the shifting visibility is very much a racialized one that centers on former settlers who are white. Um, may I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, for, uh, for while the diplomatic wrangling over the territories and the return of settlers was in no way unknown or ignored at the time of events, contrary to what uh, some scholars say, this fueled a discourse of Italian victimization over the 1947 peace treaty and the loss of Italian territories that helped to drown out the voices of Italy's former colonial subjects who were calling for post-war prosecution of Italian war crimes, as when the Ethiopian delegation submitted Italian names to the UN War Crimes Commission, but to no effect. So I conclude the book with an analysis of the politics of housing and resettlement schemes for national refugees in Italy, drawing attention to how architectural projects associated with fascism, like the monumental new towns, were sometimes repurposed as refugee quarters. Uh, next slide, please. 
Into such landscapes arrive national refugees explicitly positioned no longer as the pioneers of an imperial or irredentist redemptive project, but rather as agents of a national reclamation from fascism and from imperialism, a project that in several instances actually completed the work of land redemption left unfinished. Uh, next slide, please. However ambiguous then, national refugees could make a claim to belonging and possess the symbolic capital and role that foreign refugees and other migrants, or even the citizen brown babies whose Silvana studies did not. So the world refugees made, and I think we can end the slideshow, Constantina, it might be easier. Uh, the world refugees made thus offers a history of the present and a critical intervention into current debates over both citizenship and migration in Italy. The arrival in the Italian peninsula of colonial repatriates with claims to Italian citizenship directly impacted the reception of foreign refugees and other migrants, not just in the immediate post-war period, but for the duration of the Cold War. Burdened with the costs of resettling its own displaced citizens, Italian officials insisted again and again that Italy could not absorb uh, foreign migrants. So foreign refugees were to be housed only temporarily in Italy until they could be resettled abroad permanently. When Italy's economy began to recover and take off in the late, late 1950s, UNHCR officials pushed Italian officials to reconsider and to begin to permit some foreign refugees to remain in Italy permanently. But Italy continued to insist that as a country with long-standing issues of surplus population and outmigration, it could not become a site of permanent resettlement. In fact, in signing on to the 1951 Geneva Convention on Refugees, Italy was one of the relatively few countries to adopt what was called the geographic reservation, which meant it would only host European refugees and only temporarily, that is, Italy would only be a transit country, and this remained in place until the end of the Cold War. Yet this dynamic of increased opportunities for citizenship by diasporic Italians, together with narrowed possibilities for naturalization by foreigners, has deeper roots going back to the beginnings of Italian statehood. Scholars have stressed how the consolidation in the early post-unification state of a citizenship regime rooted in Jus Sanguinis reflected Italy's desire to protect its migrants, its residents migrating abroad by facilitating return migration or acquisition of citizenship by descendants. But it was Italy's colonial expansion in the 1880s and 1890s that first led the state to sharpen and refine what had previously been fluid and sometimes interchangeable uses of terms like citizens and subjects. The latter term became reserved for native peoples in the African colonies, whereas the citizen designation applied to Italians in the Italian peninsula or the colonies. So from almost the beginning of Italy's existence, citizenship encoded a whole series of assumptions about race and belonging. The first liberal Italian state increasingly scrutinized foreigners in the Italian peninsula with fears about aliens, especially Germans and Austrians reaching a fever pitch during the first world war. Thus, even before the fascist regime imposed a series of laws that were designed to prohibit interracial unions and to strip mixed race children who had been legally recognized by their Italian father of their Italian citizenship, as well as to bar Jews from public life and deprive them of their assets, Italian citizenship rested on an understanding of dissent that had profoundly exclusionary consequences. And I think Silvana will talk much more about this. The history of transformations and continuities in Italy's citizenship regime provides critical background to today's Jus Soli movement. And again, Silvana talks about this to a great extent in her book. Um, I'll just add that members of the G2, the second generation, who have spearheaded demands for birthright citizenship in Italy, um, that this debate has been reinvigorated by BLM activism. And this movement has linked up with critiques of racism in Italy, non solo in America, um, critiques past and present, together with remembrances of victims of the Mediterranean passage by which today's migrants seek to make their way to Europe. So while many commentators have stressed the supposedly unprecedented nature of contemporary migrations in the Mediterranean, the classifications defining status as a migrant, whether it be as a refugee, a returning citizen, or something else, have long histories. And to paraphrase, paraphrase Silvana, those are not colorblind histories. So our panel today points to ways to examine il colore della migrazione and il colore della cittadinanza. Thank you so much. And thanks, Constantina, for your help with the slides. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so we're going immediately to Silvana.
Uh, Silvana, can you share? Uh, you have to unmute yourself and share your screen. Yes, I'm going to try now. Uh, okay, first of all, let me thank Constantina uh, um, for organizing this seminar and giving me the opportunity to present my book in, uh, in this colloquium. And I'm also happy to be here with um, other historians who are working on similar issues and questions. So it's a great pleasure and a great honor. In my presentation, I will uh, uh, tell you something uh, uh, about what the book uh, is about, the genesis of the book, uh, and how, uh, by writing this book, uh, I try to speak to some pressing question of the present. So as uh, Kamala uh, already mentioned, this is a, is, is a kind of history of the present. Uh, in my book, I tell uh, the story of the children of color born at the end of World War II from the encounters between white Italian women and non-white um, allied soldiers. I reconstruct uh, the way these children, uh, we don't know um, their exact number, but possibly two or 3,000, were perceived and racialized in a society that came out of, of 60 years of colonialism and 20 years of a fascist regime that had institutionalized anti-Black racism and anti-Semitism, uh, among other uh, exclusions. Uh, unless they had been uh, recognized by their fathers, a rare event, the brown babies, as they were known in the African-American community, were Italian citizens, and yet they were often perceived and described as little aliens, as children of another race. In Italy, they were generally called uh, uh, mulattini, uh, little mulattos, a term that had a strong uh, racial connotation of a biological kind. Many of them were raised in orphanages run by uh, religious personnel. Those who were in charge of their assistance and the press cast their presence as a problem. Even if it had uh, a different meaning, uh, we must remember that the term problem calls to mind uh, and called to mind another period uh, when the mixed race was, uh, was constantly described as a problem, meaning the period of state racism under fascism. And we must recall that in post-fascist Italy, of course, uh, nobody was punished for having participated in the application of the racial laws, not to mention the fascist and not all of a sudden disappeared. Of course, there was another stigma uh, that affected the brown babies, namely the fact that they were born out of wedlock and in the context of a lost war. And their mothers were heavily stigmatized too, considered um, prostitutes or um, generally not considered as, uh, as agents, right? They were uh, either uh, victims of rapes or prostitutes. But on top of that, and stronger than that, I argue that there was the stigma of uh, the black and brown skin, uh, which for many was still a marker of an essential difference and inferiority. Other European countries too, uh, Germany, Britain, France, had brown babies born in similar circumstances. And the Italian case bears many similarities with those countries. But Italy had also some peculiarities uh, one of these being uh, the extent to which Catholic clerics uh, were involved in the assistance to the children. One of these clerics uh, who sat on the board overseeing a quasi-state agency in charge of war victims uh, and had its own foundation to help uh, uh, children uh, also, uh, you know, victimized in other ways, devised a plan to send the mulattini to Brazil a country in which, in his view, they would not find the hostility that they encountered in Italy. And here you can see uh, Don Gnocchi, who uh, had assembled a few of these uh, children in one of his uh, homes for children. Uh, this seemingly well-intentioned plan uh, hid, uh, which as far as I know, uh, did not come to fruition, he had, in fact, ideas about their essential difference, not only of skin color, uh, but of temperament and character, a difference linked to their alleged race. These ideas still had purchase also in the Italian scientific 
community, which after the war did not really question its views on race and its collaboration with the racist campaigns of the fascists. Uh, even those who subscribed to the uh, manifesto on race uh, were never made to pay for it. In the second half of the 1950s, a prominent doctor and geneticist who had supported the racist legislation of fascism and was at the same time a fervent Catholic, here he is, uh, you can see him close to um, uh, Pope uh, Pius XII, uh, who uh, he, he was uh, an advisor of. Um, so uh, his uh, name is Luigi Getta, who was also a, a notorious anti-communist crusader. Uh, he subjected the children to a barrage of measurements to write a ponderous study of what he called meticciato di guerra, race crossings of war. It came out in 1960 and received very positive reviews, at least in Italy. Besides reconstructing the experiences and representations of the brown babies, in my book, I also pay attention to uh, the anti-racist sensibilities that were present in Italy, especially in the 60s. Uh, and I reflect on what I believe were the limitations of these sensibilities. First of all, the fact that often, again, uh, the attention was focused on what was taking place on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, but not on what was taking place in Italy at the time. Now, let me now uh, say uh, something on the genesis of uh, my book. It was uh, a memoir denunciation published in 1980 that got me started on the research for this book. Uh, the memoir denunciation entitled uh, Nero di Puglia was published by Feltrinelli, so an important publisher. Uh, the author, Antonio Campobasso, was born on the same day in which the Republic was proclaimed, June 2, 1946. And in his book, he recounts in prose and in verse a difficult life experience in which he was often institutionalized and constantly reminded of the color of his skin. The Republic proclaimed the equality of all without regard to sex, race, nationality, religion, language. But in fact, the black Italian like Campobasso felt that his humanity and belonging were not fully recognized. When the book was published, it received a critical acclaim, but nobody apparently felt the need to investigate the stories of other war children of color like Campobasso. Campobasso denunciation was read as the singular experience of a marginalized person rather than a testimony pointing to a larger issue. And I would say also a more specific issue. So it was used, it was read in sort of universal terms, right? As uh, the case of, of a marginal individual. Uh, the reasons may be several. Italy was still in the grip of terrorism. The access to post-1945 archives was still difficult. This is something that Pamela also points out. Uh, there were not many um, Black Italians living in Italy at that time. Italy was just starting to be the destination of migrants from non-European countries who found it difficult to enter France and Britain. But I believe that one important reason uh, what, uh, has to do also with the fact that Italians don't generally question the still dominant, although increasingly contested, ethno-racial conception of Italianness. The assumption that Italians are white and Europeans in spite of all the ethnic mixing that has taken place in the peninsula over the centuries. I thought that focusing on the story of the brown babies would allow me to um, to know not only what happened to the idea of race after the fascist racial state, um, but to see the impact that it had on people who had a darker skin than the average Italian in a period in which black Italians were still few and Italians did not think that they had a race problem. There is often the idea that racism in Italy is the product of the wave of immigration from non-European countries that started in the early 1980s. In fact, anti-Black racism had not gone away after the fall of fascism and the end of colonialism. It had only temporarily retreated, but it has re-emerged 
in full force since the arrival of people from non-European countries. This is why we need to know more about the history of race in democratic Italy. The story of the war children can be easily connected to the story of the many children with a dark skin who are born and grow up in Italy today. They too still face discrimination for the color of their skin. I was struck by the words that one of these children, a nine-year-old um, of Moroccan origin, told his teacher uh, a few years ago. I do not have white skin, it is true, but my skin is not black either because it's brown. Negroes have a black skin and I'm not black, I'm Arab. The color of my skin is different from theirs and it is a bit different also from that of Italians. In my view, if the color was black, it would be worse. This child has a clear understanding of the hierarchy of skin color and the consequences that a darker you can have on the status of a person in a society in which the somatic norm is white. The current citizenship law bases it is on youth sanguinis then does not help inclusion and integration. It excludes from citizenship large numbers of people. The children of immigrants born in Italy have to wait until they are 18 to apply for naturalization and then have to wait other years for the Italian bureaucracy to decide on their cases. This law is already outdated and must be changed. The possession of citizenship is indispensable for people in very vulnerable position as the children of immigrants are. And yet, as the story of the brown babies makes clear, and as also what Pamela tells us, in, tells us clearly in her book, the acquisition of a legal status is not enough for real inclusion. This is the real issue, namely the need to change the overall self-perception of a society, its own self-image and imaginary. There is often the idea that because Italians' whiteness is more shaded than the whiteness of other Europeans, they tend to be more open and inclusive. In fact, hostility towards people with a darker skin, especially poor and immigrants, is very high in today's Italy, both in the North and in the South. This is why it is important to write um, this kind of history, uh, to reconstruct this past and to reconstruct the, uh, the past of slavery in Italy, uh, the long history of, uh, of racism. There's often, again, the tendency also in Italy to conflate racism and fascism, but racial and racist thinking has persisted after the fall of the regime and cannot be simply conflated with fascism. Again, it has a longer history. The story of the brown babies shows continuing presence, albeit in some new forms, in the democratic state founded by democratic forces after the fall of the regime. So the resurgent racism today not just the result of the arrival of migrants from non-European lands, it has this longer history. And uh, the previous regimes have uh, uh, lasting legacies. Uh, and it is enshrined uh, in a citizenship law, which does not mention race, but makes blood ties a uh, basis for citizenship. Thus the story of the brown base is a story that hopefully could contribute to raising the awareness uh, of the multiple roots of racism in today's Italy and of the need to overcome the ethno racial assumption that, uh, about Italianness. Many are engaged uh, in this work, uh, as Pamela already mentioned, starting with the Italian citizen and the Italian without citizenship, uh, that, uh, uh, who in recent years have been organizing and pressing to change the citizenship law. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Uh, Silvana, if you can stop uh, sharing. Um, yeah. I will uh, open the discussion now because you, we don't have a lot of, uh, of time. Please uh, um, either raise your hand or write a question or comment you may have in the chat. Uh, but let me just open uh, with uh, one um, observation and comment on my part. Um, what I like about these three books is it's that, uh, first of all, they remind us uh, our uh, duty um, as uh, public and civic intellectuals, as historians, to be, I mean, uh, engaged in the public and civic, uh, civic arena regarding all these, these issues. 
Um, the second thing that I, I find uh, that it's important and put these three books together is that uh, all these three interconnected subjects, slavery, race, decolonization, colonization and decolonization are, are all unrecognized subjects of Italian history, uh, more or less. Uh, race, as uh, you all almost said, like uh, especially Silvana said, uh, has been uh, seen as completely irrelevant to Italy. And Italy has been, you know, it's perceived still today to be uh, a non-color country or a white or non-color uh, country. Um, I believe that history was more um, um, laid into getting into these subjects than uh, Italian cultural studies. Uh, this is my impression. So my first question to, like, I want to open with this question to everybody. It's a double question. Um, it regards the public me memory and historiography regarding these issues. For example, what is the memory of slavery in Italy today? What happened, if you know, uh, Julia, to the descendants of slaves in Italy? Um, or, for example, was the Italian decolonization process as quick and, and problematic as it appears to be in public memory? Um, already Silvana talked to us about uh, the memory, how these people are talked about today. And the, and the second question I have interconnected to this is whether uh, the absence of, uh, of the absence, the, un the non recognition of this issue makes the study of race in the Mediterranean and in Euro in Europe different from the study of race in the US. How are these two different? Um, you don't need to answer to all of these, of course, but uh, you can start by sharing your thoughts and then we'll open to the questions of the public. Who wants to? Maybe, maybe I start. Julia, yes. yes. Um, so I think uh, um, the question for me were, were more the first two. So about the public memory and uh, the historiography. So um, I think in Italy at the local level, we have, uh, for instance, many studies on uh, captivity and slavery in early modern period. Uh, um, I think the problem is more the public perception of the phenomenon, uh, because the, pu the public perception is that uh, slavery and slave trade is only a colonial phenomenon uh, and uh, slave trade we think only at the Atlantic train or the Indian Ocean trade. So um, I think uh, mainly only in name book for uh, a school, uh, uh, there is not really perception of uh, slavery in the early modern period uh, and uh, less in the first half of the 19th century. Uh, so I think that this is uh, um, one of, of the main uh, problem, problem, but I think today, um, for what concerns the historiography, uh, Italy is alienated with the other European country. Um, I think is not uh, an exception uh, in this direction. And about the descendant of slaves in Italy, uh, uh, yeah, th there were many assimilated. So probably a descendant of slaves in Italy today think uh, uh, to be a descendant of an Italian and to be mainly, uh, mainly white, even if we know that uh, in Italy we are, not, uh, we are not white and it is an invention. Uh, because the melange of culture, of culture and of people in early modern period was, uh, uh, was very normal, in particular in poor cities, but also in Interland, as the new research proves. Thank you, uh, Julia. Does anyone want to add? Uh, yes, Pam. <clears throat> So thank you, Constantine. I mean, those are big and important questions. Um, let me just say that in terms of the, the question of public memory and historiography. So when thinking about decolonization, I think there's there's sort of two issues that I'm interested in. And one is the, the claim um, by scholars that it was a non-event at the time, right? And, and then that would mean, of course, that there's no real memory that's laid down subsequently. So in the book, I mostly focus on that question, reconstructing 
the response at the time. And as I said, I mean, there were all, all kinds of public mobilizations around decolonization and repatriates were very visible. So um, I really pushed back and, and uh, I think in another presentation at Columbia some years ago, I called it an eventful decolonization. Um, then there's a question of the subsequent understanding in memory and, and history. Um, and again, it depends upon what levels of memory we're talking about. What, one of the things that really struck me when I was starting this project was when I would mention it to people. Everybody who was of a certain age was like, oh yeah, we had the neighbor who came from Libya. We knew somebody who came from Rhodes. So in a way, you know, it seemed like it was this kind of common sense knowledge. And I started to think, well, that's interesting. And then got interested in these um, refugee resettlement quarters. So in the book, I talk about these idea, these memories that are hiding in plain sight. Increasingly, I'm thinking that they're not hiding, they're just in plain sight. Um, and then there's also associations formed by these groups. They have their own specific memory circuits and so on. Um, but I think it's maybe kind of the opposite of what Julia is describing is that the historiography was slower to sort of think about these different levels of memory. And in another place in an article, I've tried to think about this kind of complicated question of public memory of decolonization, Italian decolonization. And I've tried, although I don't think I've fully worked out the argument, but to use Michael Rothberg's notion of multidirectional memory to, to talk about ways in which um, Italians referring also to other decolonizations, which could appear to be a kind of displacement, that these are actually also multidirectional memories. When we think about also the presence of many Italians in other people's colonies who are also decolonized and coming to Italy in the 1960s in particular. So it's a very complicated question, but I think it's a really important one. And I'm still struggling with what terms to use, um, but certainly I'm not happy with amnesia or repressed memory to talk about these things. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, but that's so interesting. Uh, Silvana, you want to add to this? Yeah, yeah, I wanted to address um, this question of uh, the relationship between historiography, the resistance that there is in historiography, I would say, to in Italian historiography, contemporaneistica, in particular, to address this kind of issues. Uh, it seems to me that that's uh, uh, been quite evident in the fact that it's quite behind the, the type of uh, work that cultural studies people, for example, have done. And the fact that they are behind is because there has not been a, a real serious engagement between uh, historians uh, and cultural studies uh, and also post-colonial thinking. So I think that uh, it's, it's um, I would say, um, something, these, these kind of uh, um, studies have not been uh, pushed because there is an overall conservative attitude, I would say, um, a, a dominant, let's say, certain, certain, certain ideas about how you're supposed to write history, uh, do, uh, dominant among those who, who work on post-war uh, post Italy, uh, or more generally contemp contemporary, contemporary Italy. Um, and then there is the issue of how you go from reconstructing these kind of forgotten stories that are so important to communicate them to the public because it's uh, you know it's great to have these kind of studies but we also have to think about how to tell these stories uh, to a larger a larger public how to make them part of a common conversation of course it's not it doesn't depend only on us there has to be also institutional some kind of channels to do that we have to sort of put pressure if we believe in this kind of uh, in the need for this kind of history of the present to put pressure to have our voices heard because uh, um, sort of we are channeling uh, in many ways voices of people who have not been heard before. So uh, how do we get to be heard ourselves? So that's, uh, I think, a major issue also in moving uh, sort of out of the uh, it's not the ivory tower, but let's say moving up from historiography to public discourse, essentially. So um, I'll stop here for now. For now. Yeah, thank you. I find it also interesting from your answers that uh, for the early modern period, period, there is more historiography than public uh, memory of these of these issues. While for the contemporary period, is the opposite. This tells us something. So, Dominique, you have a question. 
Um, well, I mean, this is a great panel, and I think it's really meaningful, these books of coming coming out so close together and, and doing such different work. And I haven't been able to see Silvana. Congratulations. This is amazing. Um, I, I have one quick question for Julia and then a common question for all three. Julia, you, you, you're doing my favorite period, so I can't help myself. Um, both, uh, and you only had 15 minutes, so I'm sure this is just to give you space to answer that question a little bit more. Both Pamela and Silvana have spent in their talks quite a bit of time talking about the state and, and its problem of seeing. And I noticed, and when you're talking about these Italian states, these Italian states are not single agents. This isn't as much an early modern world. And we hear about the Ottoman Empire, we're hearing, you know, understood is the British Empire when you're talking about the Atlantic question. But half of the states you're looking at are Habsburg states and the Habsburg Empire is in this question and they are making treaties about abolition in and the Mediterranean, as you mentioned, is becoming a workaround against abolition. And these are things that are not dealt with as a Tuscany issue. So I'm wondering why you're positing this story in this way, is this because you are thinking about an audience the way Savannah is mentioning about thinking about the this is a history of the present? Or is there something going on in these particular Habsburg states that you think is different than talking about as Habsburg? And I'm just bringing this up because I'm gonna put it in the link. There's this wonderful article that came out in HR that is, is precisely about what you're talking about um, and so I'm just, I'm wondering if you want to talk a little bit more about the state part of the story. And for some reason, it's not going to let me do it. And for all three, the question is kind of linked to what you're already talking about. There's such hunger in the United States amongst European history to put, to bring these stories together, right? And Italy has been, as both, both Savannah and Pamela have made clear, and I agree with them, absurdly absent in talking about these histories. So German history and French history has been, have been doing a lot better job at making this part of thinking about Europe. Do you think there's something going on here that's also about some resistance amongst Italians or Italianists in thinking of, of Italy in terms of a European history of these questions? Um, does it not want to get lost in the the European history and then using Italy as a little example. Is there something really different here that explains why the Italian story has been told so slower and so much more differently than is going on in European history? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Julia, if you want, you yeah. can answer and then we have two more questions for the moment. Let's see. So thank you, Dominic, for your uh, question. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, so um, yeah, it's a, big, it's, a, it's a big question. So in my book, uh, uh, I do not focus a lot on the problem of uh, empire in, in this period, but in reality, there is a part that today I do not present here on uh, the humanitarianism in the, in the British Empire. And uh, I, I said uh, French and British on my slide because for me, um, it's quite complicated the history because from a social history point of view, I study only city for these cases. But if we have to study legislation and the abolitionist debate, I study, um, more some uh, state, also newspaper of Milan, they are not in my social history research. Uh, so um, yeah, I've tried to focus a lot uh, based in this city, in this Italian state, even if, if we know, as we know uh, in, in Venice, uh, for instance, the abolition of slavery was uh, uh, from, uh, due from the Austrian empire and also in Tuscany uh, was an agreement with the Great Britain. So the role of empire in this period is important and we know the, the role of Great Britain in Mediterranean area in the first half of, um, of 19th century also was, was really important. But probably it's true that it's lack a little bit uh, in my book, uh, a, a big reflection on the role of the empire on the, of the different empire in, in the Italian state and uh, maybe as historian of uh, abolition of slavery, I focus more only on the connection with uh, France and Great Britain. And for instance, not a lot uh, the connection with Spain as in Southern uh, Italy was mainly um, 
uh, in the Spanish uh, uh, sphere. Uh, but because really I trust that in this period, this really in Great Britain and France that influenced uh, these uh, thinkers. Uh, um, but it's not really a study on geopolitics. My study is more a, a connection among intellectuals and uh, uh, reconstruct the abolitionist uh, uh, legislation law. But it is sure that probably the role of the state and of the empire is, is really important and probably have to reflect more in my future. So thank you. Thank you, wonderful. So uh, we have two questions. I will give the word uh, first to Claudio, Claudio Fogu, and then uh, Pedro Gonzalez will take together the questions. Claudio. Thank you so much, Constantina, for putting this together. And Julia, hi, Silvana and Pamela. I, um, I'm, I take advantage of actually, uh, I see Jane Schneider and Peter Schneider also, and Nelson Mo I saw earlier. So I'm, I'm going to pose the question from the point of view of our common knowledge that uh, a, a big part of the uh, discussion on race began in Italy in connection to the Southern question, or let's say in connection to Southerness as a construction that was probably mostly racial, uh, even if it was uh, projected um, into a cultural sphere. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of wondering uh, if you think this has had any weight at all and how in the discussions that we're having now about the, the kind of willful and at times culturally coded forgetfulness, oblivion and suppression. Um, aphasia, it's one of the terms that uh, recent um, memory uh, scholars, especially for, e for Italy are using more and more. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to just tease out if you see any connections. Um, I'm thinking, of course, about the, the role that uh, Tamuriata Nera may have played indirectly or directly on a certain codification of Blackness as a part of the uh, story told and untold of the Second World War, for example, in terms of Silvana. But, but I'm thinking largely here, and of course, this is also for Julia, but mostly for Silvana and Pamela. Uh, the connection of between race and southernness as played in your story or in your larger view of racial questions. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio. Uh, Claudio. I, I, I will take also together the, the other question, if you don't mind. So, mm -hmm. Pe Pedro, hi. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you for the uh, uh, great presentations. I just have a simple question, and I was wondering if in Italy there is a central theory or narrative or discourse such as the, the one we have in Latin America, the mestizaje, which dictates who is a member of the nation and who is not and produces uh, discrimination, racism, antisemitism, and, and so forth. And if uh, there's such a thing, uh, what is the uh, mythical taxonomy or the, uh, the hierarchy? Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. So I would uh, I would say medisaccio in Italian. It's in Italian is the is the term right? Anyway, you know better. So who mm -hmm. wants to start uh, to comment on this? Perhaps we start on the opposite. Uh, we start with Silvana and then go, to Silvana. Yeah, I um I would address this question from uh, Claudia about uh, right the the racialization of the South. Right, it's clearly uh, an important. Uh, um, part of uh, the type of racial consciousness that Italians have developed uh, in, uh, um, in the modern period. Um, what I, you know, I try to resist, however, in, in my interpretation is the idea that because, uh, right, there is this internal, uh, internal racism uh, and because the um, uh, sort of identity of the Italian is, um, is rather, uh, you know, the whiteness of Italian has been contested and so on. Uh, there is less, uh, um, uh, there is somehow less whiteness in Italy. And, and so they, they are somehow less racist because of this, because of this more complex, uh, um, you know, uh, 
idea of themselves or, the, or, or complex identities that, that there are in Italy, multiple, plural, and so on. But as a matter of fact, when uh, you know the old history of the Italian state is a, a is a project of making a sort of Italian white, right? Uh, colonialism, fascism, uh, and so on. And and this kind of uh, identity is what uh, as um, you know is has been created and is is rather strong. We see we see it today. So uh, north north and south in the opposition to. Uh, to uh, to migration uh, and so and the development of the idea of uh, you know the real Italian so, so the the meticciato uh, is not really part of the national narrative um, it's it's not it's not uh, um, there is nothing I think equivalent to it or or corresponding to what you find in uh, um, in South America right that kind of idea even though again sometimes you find references to it, to this complexity, but I would say um, it's rather, you know, marginal in uh, in the self in the self understanding of Italian. It's not the dominant self understanding. I would I would argue, right? It's not that it's completely absent, but it's not the dominant. And so what what I think we have to look at is what is the the predominant narrative, and the, the other sort of competing. Uh, competing narratives, um, you know, the place, their place, um, they have a hard time to dislodge this uh, uh, this major, uh, the dominant one. Thank you, um, Pamela or Julia. Pamela, I'll I'll just um, add to what Silvana has said. Um, I mean, certainly going back to Claudio's question, I mean, we can see how Southerness from the very beginning, right, becomes this problem for Italian identity. And of course, colonialism is about overcoming um, one, I mean, whitening, uh, in a sense, whitening Italians uh, with colonial expansion, but also overcoming or, or trying to find an alternative to mass migration and this, the, the humiliations of poverty and migration, which of course are true of both the no North and the South, actually North Center and South in Italy, um, but become associated above all with Southerness, right? And I mean, I'm turning over this question um, in my head from, from Dominique, about, I really, I mean, I don't want to speak for Italian historiography, but I do think there's a way maybe that certain kind of European history models about the state, um, Italian historiography fits very uneasily into that, but, you know, there's a kind of mismatch because that history of migration that is central to the making of Italy and Italianness is always very marginal, right, in Italian national historiography or has been until recently. And so, um, you know, the, the ways in which migration and thinking about the diaspora that Italy is made in so many different places, um, that Italy as a, as a nation state is a kind of archipelago really, right? But that is not reflected um, in the historiography. And so it, it makes for these kinds of omissions or selective visibilities of these central experiences to modern Italian history. And I do think that that question of migration is very intimately connected to what Claudia has brought up about Southerness, even though, again, as I say, Italians left from all parts of the peninsula, but the memory of that is the memory of a Southern migration. Thank you. And, and Julia, do you want to add something to this? Ju Julia? No, no, maybe I can answer to Pedro. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, Pedro, thank you for the question. Uh, it's really related to my new project because I want to understand uh, how was the taxonomy of, uh, of race, uh, uh, not only in Italy, but also in, in France uh, and, uh, and in, in Spain, uh, always at the end of 18th century and 19th century. But uh, no, it's really different uh, uh, because uh, we, we don't use uh, meticciato, but in sources you find uh, more negro um, and um, a, a word I, were, I was very surprised because Silvana in her book also 
use the word uh, Moretti. And Moretti also was an expression very important in the 19th century Italy because the missionaries uh, who brought uh, uh, both slaves uh, already in the market of Cairo brought his children in Italy and the status of, his child, of these children is very ambiguous. And uh, we know the famous figure of Comboni, but uh, the, there is an innovative study of, of Giacomo Ghedini on this topic. And I think it's very interesting that also Silvana used the word Moretti in the 20th century because there is really a history of long duration. Yes, and this and this reminds me to say that I found in all uh, in all books uh, this uh, interconnection between uh, race and religion in the Italian context, which is another big issue. We could talk, but I, I'm afraid uh, we don't have a lot of time. And I want to uh, do two things before we close. Uh, first is the question posed by Chiara, and I think you can see it, uh, Silvana. You can answer. But I also want, if Eduardo agrees, because there is another recent book, which is very important, about race and the Risorgimento by Eduardo Barsotti. Uh, I couldn't include everyone in this panel. Uh, and so I would like uh, to see uh, Eduardo tell us two words also about his own work. So Silvana, if you want to address the question, and then I will give the word to Eduardo. No, I, I just wanted to... Um, um, Pick up something from uh, that, that you mentioned, that Dominique mentioned, as a matter of fact, or ask uh, about uh, if there is this kind of uh, resistance to bring this uh, uh, story, the Italian story, much more in, in dialogue with, with uh, other uh, European historiographies. Um, this is something that, in fact, I noticed too, maybe from Italian, it's particularly um, sort of in this country, but not only, right, that there is somehow... Uh, so a tendency to uh, self-isolate or so, or a tendency to discuss the, this question among ourselves as opposed to exchange ideas. Uh, uh, in part, this is due to the fact that the uh, field is small uh, in this country. So clearly there is not, a, um, I mean, a sort of a, a, a large number of people working in it, in it, on Italy in uh, American institutions. But there may be something else which I'm, um, uh, as to do perhaps again with questions of methodology, of uh, sort of opening up sort of methodologically to um, other historiographies and also dealing, I would say, with maybe issues that, you know, uh, Italian historians have to deal in, in, the current, in the current moment with this kind of uh, return, uh, return. I mean, fascism has never gone away, but now neo-fascism is quite strong. And there are battles, let's say, that are fought, that have been fought uh, since the end of the First Republic that have conditioned very clearly this historiography. So I would say it's also uh, has to do with, with history, with, uh, you know, the, what Italy is going through, has been going through these years, but, you know, also issues of, of methodology that um, what methodologies are dominant among contemporary history. Thank you. Eduardo, uh, the word to, to you. I know you have published recently a very important book uh, about yeah. uh, race and the Risorgimento. So do you want to tell us something, anything? <laughs> well, I don't know if I have enough time, but um, this idea that, that there is a racial substratum that informs the idea of citizenship is what connects my book to the research of, of Silvana. And, I mean, not by coincidence, I've been a pupil of Silvana. And honestly, I mean, I have to read those books. I read the book of uh, um, Julia. I didn't read the other book. I hope to read the book soon. And I don't know if I can say something more about the book, but I, I will not like... Mm, mm, I mean, there, there are some things that reconnect, especially with the book of Silvana, but I don't know if I have enough time to- Perhaps uh, you can tell us uh, if this idea of the, uh, the idea of Italian citizenship is connected to race uh, already by the Risorgimento period. Do you see this thing? It depends on what we do mean by race. Okay. This is an important factor. Surely legislation is pretty, 
I would say, is pretty eloquent in using terms like blood, but some legislators and some juries refer to the race. I, I know, I know, I, I, I just don't want to fall, to fall into the tricks of etymologies, but uh, this sort of shifting to the race that Silvana knows, that is the, the works of uh, Pasquale Stanislaw Mancini, seems to be a later phenomenon in the Risorgimento, but they, to a certain extent, I would say, act as a sort of dress rehearsal of, but with all the due cautiousness, of course, of the uh, idea of a of an, of an Italian race that has to be sanctioned legally. But, but I, again, in this kind of fields, I move, the, I move with extreme cautiousness because Thank it's, you, it's very, you know, it's very, it's very difficult to, to understand these sources without mm, referring to their context. And yeah, in any case, I think, I think that, that I mean, that, that's very banal and tried, but at the very core of nationalism, there is always an idea of what we do nowadays call it an ethnicity. So even, even the more inclusive forms of nationalism, you know, in the more liberal, liberal, I do not refer to the North American terminology, but to the political science terminology, uh, do not abstain from referring to a sort of archetypical uh, ethnic group. This yeah, is, this, is, this I, is a very interesting. And actually, I want to close uh, this event by there's noting- another, There's another thing that, that, yes. that I would like to add, and then I, and sure. then I shut up. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's also a factor. I don't know to what extent whiteness was very important, at least, I, I, I mean, I'm confident that it was extremely important during the, 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 the time span examined by Silvana and indeed, for example, and, and I hope to read the book because I'm very interested about the policies adopted towards adopt, adoption of black children. But uh, I, I'm just curious also about Catholicism yeah. and the mythical ancestries that are connected to the idea of the Christian people versus the, the heathens, the pagans elsewhere. So, Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. Uh, in fact, there are so many questions that we cannot address, but let me say a final note to close this. Uh, I've noticed as a, as, a, as a historian of the Mediterranean, especially of Italy and Greece, uh, of the 19th century, especially in the nation making, I've noticed this total absence uh, uh, of issues of race in both countries, Italy and Greece, um, uh, as completely relevant to the nation making. And I think that it's just very recently that historians start talking about these things. Um, and uh, I'm really, I, I think this event uh, uh, is uh, an important step towards that recognition that we have to talk about these issues and, and to see and start seeing what ways uh, we, we can do that. Uh, because the context, as you, as you all mentioned, is very important. So thank you for being here and for um, uh, you know, uh, um, initiating this conversation. Congrats on your amazing books and uh, see you all in our next event. Thank you all also for following uh, this event. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Costantina. Thank you, Pamela and Silvana. Thank you, Julia and Pamela. Thank you. Yes, thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.